Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fish Trap Fireside. It's the first virtual first Fish Trap Fireside we've ever done. Um, I feel like we should have some theme music. Any of you musicians out there, think about what theme music for Fish Trap Fireside should be for the next time. My name is Mike Midlow. I am the program manager here at uh, Fish Trap. Um, and we welcome you to be here from wherever you are in the world. What is Fish Trap Fireside? Well, it's a monthly reading series we host here featuring uh, Wallowa County readers and writers. We get all sorts of stuff, everything from poetry, fiction, science fiction, fantasy, cowboy poetry. It's been a blast. But now that uh, we all can't gather here at the Fish Trap House by the fire. We decided to uh, bring it out to the world. So welcome to all of you folks from wherever you are. Um, uh, if you haven't heard of Fish Trap or uh, Fish Trap Fireside or where we are, I want to show you a map. Our technical director tonight now is uh, Whitney Chandler, and she's going to show you a map of the world. Oh, there we are. We're all in this together, folks. And right there in Northeast Oregon is Wallowa County. You can see the Wallowa Mountains, you can see the valley, the lake. And if we go even deeper, we can see where Fish Trap is. Oh my goodness. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. There we are. And that's where I am right now, uh, <laughs> broadcasting to you uh, from the heart of Enterprise, Oregon. Um, so that's that's where we are, and we'd love to, we'd love to have you here. Um, come on, visit when the world gets a little better. I want to also say that uh, we have some sponsors who help uh, sponsor Fish Trap by our side before we get started. This month's sponsor is Enterprise Liquor. Thanks, folks. Jay-Z Lumber for providing the firewood, and the City of Enterprise for supporting this program. Thanks, folks. And if you enjoy this uh, reading tonight, and I think you are, um, I hope you take a chance to go to the, uh, to, to go to fishtrap.org and uh, throw a little tip in the jar. Um, Whitney, could you throw up, oh my gosh, there's the site right there. Um, you can just uh, throw in five bucks or 10 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever you want um, um, because these folks have come from all over the place to, to do this. So, curl up on the couch, you do yourself something delicious. You're going to enjoy readings tonight from Eric Greenwell, Zani Schaffler, and a special guest from Oakland, California, Nick Jana. So, let's get to the show. Here we go. Eric Greenwell grew up on the banks of the Mississippi River in Big Ag and Big Box country where neighbors joked that there were bars and churches on every corner. There are. Uh, in 2014, Eric earned an MFA in poetry from the University of Moscow where he also received an Ac Academy of American Poets Prize as well as a Writing in the Wilds and Port Townsend Writers Conference Fellowships. From March 2016 to 2017, he lived with his partner Belinda on a remote and primitive homestead in the Rogue River Wilderness. If you've never been there, it's an amazing place. As the Penn Marjorie Davis Boyden Wilderness Writing Resident, Erica's works has appeared in the Boston Review, Terrain.org, Keeney International Literary Magazine, Moss, a journal of the Pacific Northwest, Duct Tape Diaries, Poet Lore and Iron Horse Review, Literary Review, among many others. Uh, one of my favorite Fish Trap Fireside readers, um, Take It, Eric Greenwell. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm happy to be here in my living room because I'm always happy to be in my living room <laughs> um, and to read uh, some poems to you folks. Um, I decided to go with. Uh, a lineup of all new stuff. So I'm just gonna launch right into it. This poem is called uh, Tai Chi Chuan, or um, a lot of people know that as Tai Chi. <clears throat> um, here we go. If we're going to beat the drum, I might as well play this symphony. I might as well, if it's the bank we're saving, say, cash me out, desert rose, honeysuckle, prairie smoke, because I assume it's not the snow or cloud we talk about. 
it's not every seed, sepal, or petal, the crust put away for rainy days. If we have to say exchange rate, let me remind myself a Viking funeral is still a funeral and flaming boats are those ashes windswept or settled to the bottom of this still untreasured lake. If we need to say gold, say nothing gold can stay. Not even an orchestra of light those serrated peaks play once and never more like the sharp and flat notes of a heart monitor that carries its true audience away. I got you a singing electrocardiogram. If we have to say change, let us say damn straight. There are galaxies where that came from. And if, if we have to mourn our being broke, let us revel in these hours, seconds, sunrises, we were sweetly shunned when the moon whispered, the light has three hands and all the canyon lands write a weathered opus with mines of falling water in a series of pitches only dog whistles can hit. So that poem is called Tai Ji Chuan, and this one's called Say. Because a moon's bluish reflection in black glass is still not the moon. Because two-story houses crowd the lake like unequivocal dreams in egg crates and I can't sleep. So I turned over a wren skull like the letter U plucked from words like lung or plug and fashioned a lifeboat. I told myself, each nail I pounded home was a resurrection. Each rope of sinew I'd weave, each oar I'd crack and whittle from bone side the loss of its own hollowness. I told myself this was altruism. Before the thought could fly apart to iterations, I found myself a captain of weightlessness and whispered, I didn't do this like a shadow only. Then I saw them fading from my window toward the light. And this poem has a suggestive title, but I promise it's less dirty uh, than it sounds. It's called Clay Colored Nuts. <clears throat> Who knows the fashion of every little casualty? This goose woundless and elegantly dead as if the city park were the walk-in cooler of some uptown restaurant where water waterfowl are made lavish again on white stone plates. Maybe this restaurant is five stars burning out at their own half-religious paces, and the sixth star is a pink nebula someone named Neil or Pill calls eagle or horsehead because of the shape dust makes when stars explode. People talking these days sound to me like this unpunctured tuxedo of feathers looks on a Canadian frozen transglobal migrator. In the time it takes the community ice rink to re-slush, the paper receives two letters to the editor why it met its timely or untimed end by the restrooms where someone stole a wall heater last month, month tapped the hot wire with clay colored nuts. Um, I'm just gonna keep rolling. Um, this one is called Morality. Um, and I, you know what, I'm just gonna, so I live uh, in this beautiful Lao Valley with everybody else um, in the little Google Earth thing. And out my back window is the Lao River. Um, it's a beautiful little uh, river. And I wrote this poem after sitting uh, on my patio with a neighbor. It's called Morality. Um, my neighbor peels the kiwi because his hand is still good for clutching knives. Fuzzy helixes pear from the meat like smoke from live trees. I bought this house to listen to the river, how it wears stones with the edges of stones. All the old men are dead. It is the young men who will say yes or no, said the chief the day his home, this valley, would become heaven in a sense he was forbidden to come back here alive. His final years spent leaving tracks deleted from frost like empty hourglasses Hounds can smell all spring. The sound his people made to build in mind a fence of limbs for trapping fish is now this river's name. Back east, we'd call these rivers creeks, creeks sloughs. I wanted to make this world good bad enough I forgot when I forgot what that meant, which is just the long form of not knowing. My neighbor shows me where the bullet shattered his radio, stigmated his nerve, I have to squint to see a canvas back suspending the current, 
searching willows for breaks in a tangle of switches to nest. Just how many thefts is she risking? The moon bobs upstream from us between banks, its crinkled reflection a door to fields where ghosts gather together each second with ungraspable hooks. Um, and this poem is called Hiring. And I just want to let everybody know that all the poems I've been reading tonight are on resume paper uh, because I ran out of paper. And um, this poem is about that. Um, so it's called Hiring. I'm out of plain paper and admittedly broke. So my sister-in-law brought me this box of resume stock. And while I want to write words like opal, sequoia, and lith to honor her gift. All I can think is how fitting this is. These finely pressed squares like sheets of inked bone for gods to weigh and consider. And the last poem I'm gonna read is called Quantum. One day I will be emperor of being moved. Go ahead, tides. Go ahead, fillet knife of the haiku. Go ahead, white tail, and go ahead always like you always do, bouncing into a dripping wood I say I love so much. I love sounds like a small moldy vault inside my mouth, so sue me, nameless meadow. Please, may your orchestra of blossoms draw every last glinting drop, divvy up these undivided lines of my attention like rays in a good old fashioned dust up. Call me to the courthouses of a cosmos with your gold and purple bells and altar bells and cow bells and wedding bells and divorce me now in a thousand villages of light like a night sky. Someone will reconnect me to make a scale or dancing twins or rude gavel for telling stories of their past like the seedling rooting in a meal of rotting stump. So that's all I got for you tonight. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Eric. You always do it. I appreciate it. Um, not only is uh, Eric a uh, fine poet, but he's also the conservation program manager at uh, the Wallow Land Trust and um, serves as vice president on Fish Traps Board of Directors. Uh, Whitney, let's go to his website. What does it look like? Yeah, we're going to show it. <laughs> there he is, Eric Greenwell. You can learn more about Eric Greenwell at eagreenwell.com. You can learn all about it. Okay, back to the show. <clears throat> you might want to switch to me, though. Uh, all I'm seeing. All right, our next uh, reader um, is a real treat. Her name is Zani Schaffler. And um, Zani lives a few blocks from here where I'm sitting right now, uh, just right over there. Hi, Zani. Um, she's served before as a board of directors for Fish Trap and for a time was a Fish Trap writer in residence. Zani Schaffler was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, but has lived in enterprise for the last 13 years. She's published her poems around and about and is the recipient of an Oregon Literary Arts Fellowship in Poetry. Now she's compelled to write a novel. And she's doing it. She lives with her husband Frank, her cats Humphrey and Blondie, and her dog Ferdinand. Welcome Zani. Let's, let, let's see what you have to say. Hi everyone. Thank you so much Fishtrap for doing this in the new normal way. Um, what you need to know about this scene, it's a scene from a novel I'm writing. Um, it's 1996 in this scene. There are three 17 year old girls present and it's the night of the second wedding of one of their mothers. Uh, Hank is the dog, Simon and Andy are a younger brother and friend. In the bigger night, it is dark and quiet, but in their night, there are splashes and screams and everything is fuzzy. Hank, the German shepherd, is circling the pool like a police dog. 
He barks and drools and frets and sometimes pauses a second to flick his tongue into the illuminated water. The girls are alternating between trying to make Hank shut up by saying, shut the fuck up, Hank, and getting out of the pool themselves to chase him, hovering and tripping around the perimeter. Jessie is all drips and rivulets as she trails after him, leaning forward to catch his tail but missing, finally hooking Hank by the collar, and Hank emits a cry inconsistent with his size. She squats down, her thighs and calves pressing together their long lines. She pulls the huge dog into her body. He is in her arms and she kisses his head. Hank licks her knee with his tongue, forgiving her, and she stands up, pets his back in long, heavy strokes. Her hands and arms are wet with chlorine water and Hank's dark fur coats her hands and up and down her arms. Jessie says, look at this fur. It's like that thing, that thing they do in a village when they caught the town rapist. The whole town would come out and watch it. You know what I'm talking about. She lowers her arms and looks down at Libby, who is still in the pool, appearing even more elfin than usual, with her hair slicked back, the ends fanning out Medusa style into the water. Libby holds the side of the pool with her hands. She tips her head back and up at Jessie, her face twisting in confusion, but she loses her grip with her hands, her body breaking away from the side of the pool and her head sinking under. Her hands jab out, blindly grabbing for the side, and when she snaps her head into the air, she is choking and laughing and water streams out of her nose. Jessie says, not like a town we know the name of. You know what I mean, like historically, catch a bank robber or wife murderer, or whatever, and they torture him. Jessie turns abruptly on the cement, her wet feet grinding against it, and walks to the deep end of the pool, kicking her feet out, imitating a gymnast's walk. She climbs up onto the diving board and waits. Tar and feather, dummy, Naomi yells from the shallow, shallow end. You feel like you've been tarred and feathered because of fur on your arms. I think you just look like you have big hairy man arms, rapist arms. Oh, forget it, nay, watch, Jessie says. She turns her back to the water and hangs her heels over the edge of the diving board, her toes curling and digging into the rough fiberglass. She throws her arms over her head and arches backward. She feels the muscles in her stomach stretch with the arch. She feels graceful and long. But from the outside looking in, her knees are bent. Her legs spread into a V, her toes aren't pointed, and she sort of crashes into the water. Under the water, the splash is loud and chaotic, the bubbles fizzing up against her body like bugs, disappearing somewhere along the length of her. She stays under, spins herself around. She does a frantic combination between the egg beater and the washing machine, and the dog fur from her arms floats up and rests on the surface. She lets her head come up. She wipes the water from her eyes, legs still egg beatering, and says, what was it, without even catching her breath. It was fucking ugly, Naomi says, and a blare of laughter carries down the length of the pool in the dark. Your toes weren't pointed, and your lower legs just sort of flopped in like a cadaver, not your best. It was only like a four or five jest, Libby, Libby says over her shoulder. Libby's head rolls and bounces with the waves as she grips tightly to the edge. The tips of her fingers will be cut and sore tomorrow. You've consistently gotten eight and nines this summer, so I was expecting more. Whatever, Jessie says. Jessie is the tallest in a fuchsia bathing suit. The suit has steep French cuts and used to belong to Naomi in middle school. Now it only fits Jessie, but it is even a little bit too big, baggy in the bust and loose at the stomach. Naomi knows the suit is a size six because she remembers wanting that size so badly instead of an eight or a 10. She convinced her mother to buy it for her, even though it was too short in the torso. It pulled tight up on her groin and the shoulder straps cut down into her skin. Sometimes she had to bend forward to relieve the tension of the suit on her body. It was too small. It allowed puffs of small, small puffs of pubic hair to emerge on the sides. 
She remembers being horrified when she realized. Libby holds a bottle of champagne and she drinks from it while sitting on the steps of the pool. She gets up, steps down into the shallow end and bounces her way toward the deeper water. She is scatting, or that's what she calls it. A bee bop, a wop, bop, bop, bop. Jesse, Naomi, are you listening to me? Bop, bop, a wee, bop, bop. But she's slurring the different syllables of her song together, so it sounds like a wheezy blur. I love it, Jesse says. And Naomi says, me too, Libs, it's good. And they bounce down towards Libby, start scatting along with her, only slightly less slurrily, and drink from the oversized bottle of champagne too. The bottle is so big and they are so careless with it, swinging it from their faces like some kind of enormous horn. It throws them off balance. They fall onto each other. Their bodies slide together until they are all under the water, slipping over each other's skin, pawing for the surface, thumping each other to the bottom with their desperate limbs, laughing, inhaling horrible chlorinated water which comes out of their noses and mouths as they surface. Jessie has to untangle her fingers from Libby, Libby's long blonde hair. She ends up with a chunk of it in her hand. Jessie swims to the edge, launches herself out, gets a foot onto the side and pushes her body up and out and into the hot night where she tiptoes over to the towels, wipes the webby strands of hair off her hand and onto Libby's towel. Now you'll always have a lock of your hair from the night of your mom's weird wedding forever. And during this pool time, which is the best and worst time ever, depending on which girl you are, the world is starting to understand the word terrorism. Because what they are calling a terrorist made a bomb go off at the 1996 Summer Olympics. The radio is blasting over the chaos of the swimming pool. And the news guy comes on quietly and says, there's been something terrible to happen in Atlanta. And Jesse and Naomi and Libby just stand there on the side of the pool looking at, at each other, not quite sure what to do. Because they're drunk and precariously happy. They're happy and party drunk all full of booze and summer night. But the reason they're here is that one year after Libby's parents divorce, her mother is getting married again. And it feels like a huge betrayal, which there have been quite a few of lately, but it also feels peripherally to them like a party. And now there are all these strangers, stepfather, stepbrothers, a German shepherd named Hank. All three families have always only had retrievers or labs. And now something bad for the world is happening. And it is just the start of all these things that are going to happen and happen. And all this time during the swim and during the announcement on the radio, Simon and Andy are setting off big firecrackers in the driveway unchaperoned. They light them and they go up into the sky and explode. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Zani. Wow, I feel like we're having a little private reading with ourselves that we're getting getting to share with the world. This is this is super fun. I appreciate you being a part of it. Um, before we go to our final reader, I want to tell you folks about uh, something we started at Fish Trap pretty recently. It's called the Fish Trapper Program, <clears throat> and. Uh, you know, Fish Trap started in 1988 with the mission to promote clear thinking and good writing in and about the West. And uh, hundreds and maybe thousands of people have come up to Wallowa Lake and been a part of the programming. And, and now we're offering people a chance to like be a part of the family. And uh, there are a lot of different things you can do to become a fish trapper um, for just five bucks a month. Um, you get a bumper sticker, of course, and, uh, and a, a monthly writing prompt from one of our faculty from the past 33 years. Um, and then it goes on from there. I encourage you to go to fishtrap.org and take a look and become a, become a part of, uh, of what we do here. Whether you've uh, ever been to Wallowa County or not, you can be a part of Fish Trap, and we sure would appreciate it. So, um, Speaking of uh, fine authors, uh, we've recently asked some of our greatest friends 
um, during this crisis to contribute some writing prompts, some reading, some tips, some funny anecdotes. Um, and we've been posting them on our Fish Trap page, on our Instagram page, um, on our Twitter page, and um, on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, some of them include uh, notes from Kim Stafford, Fish Trap co-founder, uh, Kathleen Dean Moore, uh, Jamie, um, Jamie Ford, um, Joe Wilkins, Naomi Shiab Nye, if the list goes on and on, we're going to be releasing these as we go. So uh, keep, keep a look, keep a look on the Facebook page and all the social media as well as our YouTube channel and take a look. All right, here we go. Now is the final reader of the evening. Once in a while, we invite uh, somebody to read at Fish Trap Fireside who doesn't live here. Um, sometimes it's because uh, they're passing through or what have you, but um, our friend Nick Jaina was supposed to be doing an artist residency in our town of Joseph, uh, right by Wallawa Lake this week, but of course that got canceled, so we decided we would um, invite Nick to read at Fish Trap Fireside virtually i'm excited about this um nick is a writer and musician um, who's called uh, among other places new orleans portland california and maybe even colorado home at one point or another his uh, memoir get it while you can was a finalist for the 2016 oregon book award he performs in living rooms libraries churches bars galleries any place people will listen i love this guy and he also just released a new novel a couple days ago, I think. Uh, it told me. Uh, it came out um, just a few days ago on um, Modern Mythology Press. So um, please help me welcome from your living room to here, our living room, Nick Jaina. Take it, Nick. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, don't, I never know if these reverse the text. Does that look reversed or does it unreverse? Okay. It told me. It looks perfect. <laughs> Sometimes it's imit imity. Uh, yeah, this is my novel. It just came out a few days ago. So I was expecting this show in person at that fireside where Mike, Mike is right now. Uh, was going to be one of the first shows of like three months of touring for me um, all around like the, the western half of the country. And I was going to be, so I'm a musician and I, I play my own soundtrack for my readings. Uh, I, uh, I won't do that tonight, but like I, I loop guitar and then read over it and play songs and there's gonna be a, it was gonna be a whole thing and then that all got canceled and so now it's all it's all virtual uh but this is my book uh i've spent three years writing it and um it's about uh music and and love and and sort of uh impossible grief like unresolved uh grief where you don't know if you have a right to grieve or you, where there's no confirmation of loss and trying to grieve in that ambiguous space uh, it also is is about like conservative talk radio and how that affects us. Um, so it might still be relevant for, for this strange new world. Um, I'm going to read a couple chapters from this uh, at the beginning of the book where the, the our protagonist is living in New York City and he's um, helping take care of an old man with Parkinson's and, and he sees that uh, this old man has a um, pass for the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, and he asks if he can use it and he he gets a chance to go to this museum in between um, trying to figure out what to do with his life. <clears throat> I meandered through MoMA looking for one painting that really meant something to me. On the second floor, tucked near the elevator, I found that painting. It was not where anyone would ever think to put a work of art. It was almost like they were throwing it away. And before the garbage man came to pick it up, the museum staff propped it up at the end of the hall by itself. It was Christina's world by Andrew Wyeth. I had seen an image of it somewhere before, but I couldn't remember where. It is of a woman in a pink dress. We are looking at her from behind as she sits in a field. She is looking at a farmhouse on the horizon. It looks like a picnic, but something was off. There was no food, no blanket. I thought first of the waitresses at the diner down the street, how jarring the pink was out there and all that green and brown. But this woman wasn't a waitress. I didn't know what she was. The next day, the man in the kitchen of the diner at Tamer of Thames left his post and came to talk to me. He had colorful patchwork of tattoos down his arm. His hair was black and thin and long and it cascaded down his shoulders like the fabric of the dancer's skirt. It showed gravity and therefore showed strength. 
You play music, right? He asked, as though stepping straight into my thoughts. Sort of, I said. I play piano. That's music, right? I saw you play in a band a while ago at, at 190 North. Oh, yes. The show with the people chattering about The Bachelor. You guys were great. I'm in this band and we're looking for a bass player. I thought maybe you'd know someone. We're leaving in two weeks to tour the country. Our singer is badass, man. Okay, maybe somebody was listening at that show after all. His name was David. And as he typed his number into my phone, I saw that, yes, that is how he spelled it, D-A-V-E-E-D. And though he was a year late, at least he finally showed up. I went back to see Christina's world over and over again. Some days I'd only spend five minutes with her. Some days I'd spend an hour. I pretended I was recording a radio show for blind people. And this would be the one way they would ever experience this painting in their lives, listening to me describe it. I cleared my throat and pretended to hold a microphone. I looked over at a father as he shielded his daughter from me. What details to include for the blind? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Christina's World, a painting by Andrew Wyeth. It is about as tall as your waist and as long as a sleeping Labrador stretching himself. Her dress is pink. Pink, if you don't know, is the color of bubble gum and piglets. Pink is the color of blankets they give to girl babies at hospitals. Pink is like a red turned soft, a soft fire truck, a soft anger, a soft apple. Her hair is pinned up. It is dark brown like rich soil in a garden, but there are these thin silver threads in it. The smallest things hold their center. The field is so many colors. The field is all of us gathered together during the fall. There is a house and a barn on the horizon. Oh, do you know what the horizon is? It's where the sky meets the ground. The horizon is not something you can ever touch or hold or put a fence around. The house and the barn are separate. There is a ladder leaning against the house. The ladder's shadow is slanted down the front of the house. Oh, right, shadows. Shadows are something else you can't touch. They happen when something gets in front of the sun and casts a flat, dark shape of itself on the ground. I want to say that Christina is a beautiful woman, but she is turned away, so you can't see her face. So if she is beautiful, it is because I want her to be. I suppose if you don't have any other information, you have to fill it in with something, and that something tells you about yourself. But also, why does a person's beauty depend entirely on their face? Anyway, thank you for your attention, dear listeners. It is an honor to describe this painting to you, perhaps my favorite painting in the world. The last time I went to see Christina's world, I tried to give a name to every shade of green and brown in that field. There was straw and army tent and potato sack and discarded cocoon. There's so many colors sprawled out in that field like a kid was running with a box of crayons and tripped and spilled them everywhere. I looked at her in that field and thought about how it wasn't beauty that I wanted, at least not in the way most men want beauty. I didn't want the destruction of it. I didn't know what the men in Christina's life had done to her, but they didn't seem to be helping her. Were they just watching her while she struggled? In beauty, I wanted freedom. Beauty seems like a permanent pass to all the rides, a guarantee that you will always be the center of excitement. To be with beauty, to dance with it, to be smiled at by it, to have its approval, would be like merging with the center point of a circle. It is a permanent hug to dance with beauty. It would solve all the aching and security and wondering why. Except, except that for all the beautiful people I'd ever talked to, none of them had ever accepted the premise that they were actually beautiful. And to the extent that they would allow that their beauty they were beautiful in some way. They claimed that it was only brought, it had only brought as much trouble, misunderstanding, and danger as anything. I was about to leave the painting for the last time when five nuns walked up, chattering. They were head to toe, dressed in their habits, but about them was the energy of being off the clock at play in the great halls of New York. They all stopped in front of the painting, my painting, and enveloped me. They were like a cloud of mist that settles on the glen in the morning, silently, respectfully settling into the dip in the environment. They ceased their talking as soon as they got in position and I felt us all standing there wondering together at the glory of creation. 30 or 40 seconds went by and I let my focus go soft and I sank into the painting with them. I saw what they saw without them even explaining what they saw. For the first time, Christina wasn't a tragic soul. She wasn't tossed about by chance. Her longing toward the barn was an envy. It was acceptance. She was proud of her struggle. It carved her into a better form of human. It made her a spirit to behold. As she looked at the house and the barn, the nuns and I stood behind her, admiring the torque in her back. We were there with her, and we weren't. We were Christina, after all. 
I thought of something I read Andrew Wise say in a big book in the gift shop. I get literally hundreds of letters a year from people saying that it's a portrait of themselves and they rarely mention the corporal quality. They don't see that. But I never thought that. I didn't think I was her. I felt like I was standing behind her. The looming angle gives you such a direct feeling that you were there and you're standing up while she was on the ground. It is such a silent condemnation of the viewer's complicity and the cruelty of the able body. That woman, the actual woman, Christina Olson, dragged herself around the fields because she couldn't use a wheelchair out there. She wouldn't have had a clean dress unless it was new and she had just put it on if it was a special occasion like her birthday. So maybe that's why I like the painting. Maybe it was a little celebration in a field in Maine. And in the midst of that, she was looking with hope up at the farmhouse because no matter what, she still had to crawl along that entire field, negotiate the divots and the burrs, try to hold on to some dignity in her pink dress. All the hours I spent looking at that painting, I had never looked at it with such hope. I wanted to thank the nuns for seeing the painting this way, but I didn't want to break the holy silence. I tried to hold it as long as I could. Then one of them gathered herself, turned to the others and said, so, where's the cafeteria? That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. I have stories about MoMA too, and maybe, <laughs> maybe the rest of you do too. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, well, folks, that's it. This was our first try at, fish, at a virtual fish trap fireside. I think it was a blast hanging out with Eric, Zani, Nick, and our technical director, Whitney. Um, we've, had a, we've had a good time. I hope you did too. Look for more videos uh, from Fish Trap coming up in the coming weeks. Uh, check out our Facebook page, um, Twitter, Instagram, all the different things. Um, and if you really uh, enjoyed this, go to fishtrap.org and throw a couple bucks in the uh, donation bucket. It really helps us out, especially during this time. So every little bit helps. So from all of us at Fish Trap, uh, to all of you, be safe, folks, and uh, good night. I'm going to feed the fire here.